Thanks everybody for coming today. And uh, we are gonna uh, have a little bit of a presentation from uh, two folks who are mem uh, active members of our supply chain committee. Um, uh, they, they are uh, Ted Hill, who's CEO and MVP of MVB US, which is uh, oversees uh, both the PubNet and PubEZ products. Uh, and Dan Lubard, who's founder of Iobyte Solutions. Uh, Dan and Ted have prepared about 20 minutes of materials that they're gonna kind of go through. This topic, uh, is really of interest to BISG and its supply chain committee in part because we we committed uh, at our annual meeting in April to what we call transform supply chain communications. It's a multi-year effort to try and look at uh, how all the things related to ordering, order management, uh, delivery of metadata, tracking sales, et cetera, are managed across the supply chain and to try and bring them into um, the uh, at least the mid part of the 21st century. Uh, we think that there are a lot of good opportunities. We're not going to cover all of them today. This is really an opportunity for Ted and Dan to share their expertise, but we appreciate them making the time. And I think this is going to be an important contribution to the ongoing conversation we have about making the supply chain work better for everybody. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Ted, I think, to start. And then we'll just tell me when you'd like the next slide and we'll definitely get that. Out. All right, next slide. There you go. Yeah, so this is one of my favorite quotes from one of my colleagues, and it's come up more comes up more and more in the meetings that we have. And it's really, you know, the perspective that if you can't do anything about it, it's not a problem. It's a fact of life. That doesn't mean you have to learn to live with it. But, uh, you know, not every problem can be solved. And all of us have many, many problems. And we need to focus on what can be done to make our daily lives and lives in our businesses easier. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't think about them, even if they can't be solved immediately, because you may come up with a partial solution, workarounds that accomplish the same goal, or at least just sort of the mental frame of mind that, you know, I'm not going to worry about this today because I've got other things to worry about. So it may motivate you to take uh, to participate in longer term initiatives by thinking about the big pic bigger picture sometime, such as are shepherded by organizations like BASG, uh, things that that may one day bear fruit in your daily working life. So next slide, please. So as Brian mentioned, one of the endeavors of the uh, BISG Supply Chain Committee is to look at the various elements of supply chain communications to see if they can be improved. And today, more specifically, I'm going to talk about the communications between publishers and booksellers that constitute the electronic ordering process, because increased visibility into the various markets is one of the foundations of improved order management. Um, you know, if you don't know what's selling out there, emerging trends and all that, you can't really do anything about it. And I'm going to uh, talk specifically about the um, bookseller and publisher side of things, because that's sort of the sweet spot between, uh, you know, from the businesses PubNet and PubEasy that I run. And um, we're going to talk about ways to increase visibility for booksellers and to order status so they don't call you so much and don't order under an, or over order and under order. We're going to talk about increased visibility for booksellers into stock availability and some of the issues around making improvements there. A little bit about some further out stuff about ways to streamline the returns process and a little bit at the end about um, why we should think about supporting the retailers using non-book specific point of sale systems like Shopify, um, uh, Clover, uh, um, Square, etc. So, um, whoop, not yet. So you can go back, Brian. Um, so while uh, I'm going to talk about the Indie Channel, there's obviously a lot of communication between publishers and large chains, online merchants, libraries, wholesalers, etc. Um, but the Indie Channel is particularly messy, uh, but it's also actually a particularly vibrant corner of the book market. It's rich in emerging trends regarding a highly influential class of readers, and you find out stuff about emerging genres, regional variances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It really is the finger in the pulse of, of you know, what, what our core readers are, are interested in, and it, that makes it a potential goldmine if we can find better ways to monitor and analyze what's going on. And... Uh, 
you know, just to be upfront about it, it's also a vital part of the publishing ecosystem that badly needs improvements in efficiency and profitability because booksellers are really busy people and anything that can make their decisions simpler and easier and better is something that really helps us all. Now the next slide. Today is part of the learning part of the Lunch and Learn. We're gonna do a quick review of some of the key communications between buyers and sellers. And these are what we like to call the core four EDI documents. They are the purchase order, obviously from the bookseller to the publisher, and then coming back the other way, the order acknowledgement, the shipping notification and invoices. Now, these are all fully in use in Canada, God bless them. In the US, not so much. And that's unfortunate because they're packed with useful information, especially uh, shipping notifications, which may contain data on back order status, partial shipments, split orders, et cetera, et cetera. This is stuff that you know the booksellers need to know to make better decisions. Um, and I did a little quick research and I found that only about half of the suppliers on PubNet supply them. And then maybe even only half of the retailers uh, who are on PubNet and PubEasy are, well, PubNet are set up to receive them. And it's a complicated issue. Um, the main source is that there's a lot of point of sale systems out there, at least a half dozen core ones, and then a whole bunch of others floating around. And, and these are ones that are set up for EDI um, that can really automate the electronic ordering process. The ones who, by the way, don't have those systems can order through our PubEasy service, which has a web interface, which has other advantages um, and benefits, but there's also some issues with that too. Um, in terms of giving them the tools they need to do effective order management. So um, let's see. Uh, and you know, even with just talking about how the tools we have aren't fully implemented, almost every supplier we have uh, can supply invoices, but you know, perhaps half of the booksellers take advantage of them because they don't know they can because of their system or whatever. So even if the, the pieces of, the, of an, effic an efficient communications regimen are in place, not everyone is fully using that. Um, but there are obviously ways to deal with this, which we can talk about during the Q&A session for those who are interested. The other thing I'd like to talk about are some of the other communications that are uh, go between buyers and sellers. One are things like price and product updates. You know, people want to know about uh, if the prices have changed um, and other updates, uh, you know, in the, to what's going on, not just availability, but, but other uh, title changes and, and new versions and that sort of thing. Um, and then there's order status checks, which are done in several different ways in, with various uh, benefits, but an order status can tell you what's on the way, what's not, you know, uh, where the issues are. And, um, uh, and then finally, the whole issue about product availability checks. And this is one of the issues which I'm going to take a little bit more time on right now. Um, and because we have a very, very common problem with, uh, you know, booksellers say are going to place a large order and they want to know whether the publisher has sufficient inventory in stock. Now we can tell them yes or no, if the title's available for sale uh, and if it's in stock, but we can't tell them if there are 500 or a thousand units. And, you know, it's funny, I was just on a call today with Barnes and Noble, who wanted to know if they can get better information before placing large orders from a lot of their stores. As uh, you know, they're pushing down a lot of the ordering and in-store order management to more of the store level, and which is a very good thing, I, in my view. Um, but it still raises that question, do I have to call the sales rep every time, you know, I want to see if I can order 50 copies of a textbook for an adoption, or if there's a fast moving title. And it's one of the problems which I don't really know if we could solve them uh, without, I think, a certain amount of collaboration. And the main issue is that for titles that are fast moving, when inventory is getting uh, scarce, there are certain players in the market, could be wholesalers, could be online retailers, could be large chains, who have the capability to take, to go out and grab up a lot of inventory because they don't want to make sure, you know, they know they're probably going to go through it over time. And, and it's a concern for the publishers, uh, you know, about how do we manage this process? Um, and, and uh, 
you know, let people know whether large orders are going to actually go through without having to physically go and check on them. Um, there are some solutions in place. Uh, Ingram, for example, has their Indie Vault where they set aside um, uh, quantities of, of stock just for ordering by the Indies to make sure that, you know, they're not competing against larger players to get what they need. But um, it is something that is a, a frequent ongoing pain point. But I think it's one where there could be solutions. And uh, some of it involves publishers perhaps opening up more of that information. Um, and some of it involves, you know, uh, uh, maybe going to a red light, yellow light, green light system. But, you know, what I want to, people to take away here is that there's a lot of great stuff out there in the supply chain now, a lot of great information, but it's not necessarily comprehensive and complete and or uh, to the point where it is fully useful as it could be and as it should be. All right, next slide. Um, two others, uh, opportunities I'd like to talk about briefly. One um, are two distinct opportunities to improve the supply chain for better order management. And these are using EDI documents for returns and also for better communications with the generic point of sale systems, as I, I mentioned up front. Now, what we have here are what we would call the core four, only for returns. And there are standard documents that address all of these issues. There's one called a returns authorization, which is like a reversed purchase order. It goes from the bookstore to their publisher saying, I got a bunch of stuff. I want to send it back to you. And um, the publisher does something that's an authorization acknowledgement, which is sort of the reverse version of a purchase order acknowledgement, where they say, yes, these are all authorized for return. Um, um, or some of them are not, and that the bookseller wants to know too before they pack them all up and ship them out. Um, and then the bookseller could theoretically also send a shipping notification with that. All of this direct from their point of sale system to the supplier's ERP system uh, that tells you you've got three boxes coming and even could even go down to the level of here's you know the titles that are in each box. And then finally, the uh, returns version of the invoice would be something called a credit note. It's really not an invoice. It's really a notice saying, yes, you've earned a credit, but there's obviously a whole separate uh, process to go and redeem that credit. But at least it gives the bookseller some information about, about what they could know, um, uh, excuse me, what the uh, amount of that credit might be. Now, none of these are being used anywhere today. Um, and it's interesting because in theory, the capabilities are there, EDI capable point of sale systems, uh, EDI capable ERP systems, but getting all of the suppliers to start actually, you know, exchanging these documents and getting the booksellers and the point of sale systems able to use them. Uh, and the booksellers are actually setting, getting, using them and putting them into their workflow is not a simple process. But it's something that you know everyone talks about. What can we do about returns? This is one solution that's out there, um, uh, waiting for an, a, a, an implementation strategy to perhaps make it possible. It's one of those things that's worth, I think, having the industry put in the back of their mind, you know, for future reference. And then uh, finally, I'd like to make a quick note about the non-book specific POS systems. You know, we all have have handed our our cards over or Apple Pay to you know the local uh, Square system at your coffee shop. Um, but uh, what many people may not know is that these POS systems are are increasingly being used by bookstore cafes and pop-up stores and yoga parlors and maybe restaurants that have a small book section, any number of, 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 uh, of, of merchants who sell things other than books, but do sell books. Um, and there's a big problem with them because they don't uh, have the kind of robust inventory management and planning capabilities that you might find in, in an anthology or a book log or a book manager system, which is really designed for handing a large number of different kinds of uh, stock types and, and looking at rates of sale and all that kind of thing over a large, large uh, uh, catalog of titles. 
But these are our customers. If you're a supplier, you want these people to buy their books. They're reaching readers in, in all sorts of places other than a traditional bookstore. And also, I should note that many of the smaller, newer bookstores go on them because they're easy and simple to get set up with and relatively inexpensive. But they are not, a at this point, a long-term solution uh, and certainly not something that can contribute robust data into a sort of a greater supply chain oversight and, and intelligence. So so I would say that um, uh, these are a few of the problems. I've gone through them very quickly. We can go into more depth if you like uh, when we get to the Q&A period. But it's, uh, it's really sort of the, the nitty gritty of, of about this, this uh, relationship between the bookseller and the publisher that's been you know, going off for quite some while. I'd uh, like to turn it over now to Dan, who has got a very different perspective and uh, is uh, uh, going to be talking about working with some of the larger suppliers, uh, excuse me, larger retailers, and some really specific stuff that I think you're going to find super interesting. So, uh, uh, Brian, on to the next slide. Thank you, Ted. Okay, hi, everybody. Uh, Dan Lubart. Um, I could talk about data analytics and how they relate to these topics for hours on end without breathing in, but I will spare you that and try and do a quick uh, highlight a few things around a broader framework of how data managing data helps support these processes. So I'm going to start with a quote that I, I find incredibly helpful, uh, which is, uh, as you can read, not everything important is measurable and everything measurable is important. And the, the point there is data by itself could be interesting, but not useful. And so I am really trying to focus on how we can use measurement to support the process, make it better, uh, more efficient, so you can do more with less people. One of the, one of the most common problems I, I come across with clients is they have a catalog of hundreds or thousands of books, but only 20 are getting any attention at a moment because there's only so many hours in a day. So one of the things we look at is how do we do better for everything behind those top, the, the front list? Uh, let's go to the next slide, Brian, and I'll hit some of the, so here are some common questions. Now, my background, again, is different from Ted. Ted's in this much more into the infrastructure of how order management flows. I'm more looking at it from a uh, how it connects. It's part of the eco ecosystem between inventory and sales velocity and manufacturing fulfillment. So all of which weigh in on ordering. Uh, and then what do I do with orders? Not 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 mechanically, but when do I fill and do I not fill? So we're going to get into a bunch of those things. So just this is just a sort of a, a, a list of some points, not in priority order and not necessarily the most important, but things I hear about, which is, for example, when to use in-stock protection. And I'm opening these up, obviously, for the Q&A if people are interested. But the big question there is, you know, in some cases, ISP can completely wipe out your margins, but there is a benefit for example, to protecting your sales velocity, especially early in a book's life cycle, that even if you're losing a nickel per unit, it still may be worth it. And there's there are ways to analyze this and support this uh, question. Uh, and obviously, that's available now with you know several of the very largest uh, retailers and and wholesalers out there. So it's a, it's a common question. Uh, timing relationship between metadata timing and purchase orders. So, so another common problem. At, with a somewhat counterintuitive result is that a lot of publishers try to get that metadata in, let's say, four months before on sale date. And we're finding now uh, there is going to be an Amazon-centric uh, focus to a lot of what I talk about because it, it is the biggest question many publishers have. Six months is actually more important. And the reason I bring it it's a metadata, Brian's like, why are you talking about metadata here? Because Amazon's forecasting is impaired when you when you are later than that six months. They actually, and this is the counterintuitive part, uh, we have found they can overorder, which then generates returns. So it's not order processing, but this is a factor that should weigh into your decisions that will ultimately uh, come to surface when the orders, the initial orders start coming in, and then unfortunately three months later when those initial returns start coming in. So we can talk more about that. Um, another big one is. Uh, you know, whether it's Amazon or anybody else, and Ted alluded to this, you may not be able to fill every order, or even if you have the inventory, you may not want to fill every order. So why why would you not? Well, obviously, if you fill an order that you believe is too big, that implies potentially returns. If you underfill it, of course, then you look at the out-of-stock problem. The point I want to make here is 
to the best of a publisher's ability, don't depend on retailers to do your forecasting. You should wrestle that data into a way that you can have your own opinions on because you know more about your book than the retailers do. You know your publicity events that are coming up and you know other things. And you need to be able to say, I don't think this, I think this order is too big and I'm going to underfill it. It can get more complicated when you get multiple units, uh, multiple locations, uh, and we can get it there. So there are some reasons why do you want to balance the locations or just fill some over others. But blindly filling orders, even if you have inventory, isn't always going to be your optimal outcome. Uh, and then the last thing is, you know, tight shipping windows. And this creates, well, I mean, let's talk, you know, Amazon often has a three day, three business day shipping window. And sometimes that's just not going to be able to happen. There's actually an interesting uh, concern with that, which is if you are late, uh, more, I believe it, there's a there's a certain percentage, and I don't know if it's the same for everybody, you'll start getting hit with chargebacks. So the, you may want to make a decision to cancel an order, and then just, you know, likely it'll come back again next week and fill it then if you're not able to get it out on time. So this is another area of, uh, you know, of concern that so, some of my clients are aware of, some are not, and, and then they get hit with the chargeback. So I just want to raise it again to see if people have questions or concerns about that. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Brian. And then we can now talk about what I sort of say is the larger framework of, you know, using data to help run your business better. And this is what I focus on almost to, to exclusion of everything else is, is everything about that. And there's a couple of key questions here. What data is important here, right? So if I want to better manage my order process, for example, and I want to, let's say, you know, have my own forecasting uh, to help inform decisions, what data helps that? You know, the sales velocity, uh, Amazon's inventory or, or Ingram or someone else's inventory that we, we know they currently have and what the, what the orders are. Uh, you know, my, my manufacturing turnaround time can inform that. I may want to overfill if I know it's going to be a long lead time. Uh, my ability to fill those orders quickly. All the, there's a lot of data that can that ties in here. Um, how to efficiently acquire a line and use this data. So now the question becomes, okay, that data would be interesting. How do I get it in one place quickly enough in order to support my decision-making? So what, what I get, mean by this is I could probably pull in the data to support those that front list, the top 10, 20, 50 books, but how do I do it for my entire catalog? Because I'm getting orders on my backlist too. So there are uh, op uh, techniques for doing that that can really help if I can talk more about, but I'm, I can't do it in this session, right, this uh, moment right now. Uh, how to prompt identify problems, opportunities. Now, this is critical. This is the ability to, to say, there's going to be a problem four weeks from now or I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. I can start to act on it now and not wait again for my trading partners to tell me we have a problem. We're at, you don't want to hear you're out of stock. You want to know you're going to be out of stock in four weeks so you can at least have an opportunity to address that quicker. So timing and, and getting ahead of these problems and creating reports or filters that say, here is something that is uh, we need to be focusing on now, not next month. And then the last thing is simply, uh, this is a, a broader topic, which is the concept of measuring and testing. This is uh, pretty standard in, in a lot of industries. It had been much less so in publishing when I started working in the industry over a decade ago. Uh, it's gotten much better, but there are still, uh, like it anywhere, companies that are better at it and companies that are not as good at it. The ability to develop a plan to test, measure, and repeat is critical because then you can say, okay, I am doing these things to improve, but if I can't measure and quantify the improvement, I'm really just guessing. Uh, so it may be helping, but I don't know. So the ability to quantify what you're doing, so lowering returns rates, lowering out of stock rates, improving sales, uh, those are all the the measurements that can support, are we doing better with order management? And again, you know, this is one area of it, different from what Ted talked about. Uh, and so tying into actually something, you know, my quote and something Ted had said before, data needs to, to be useful. It needs to be meaningful, measurable, and actionable, right? So if I, if I can't do anything about it, then it's just interesting. But if I can, it can change my business. So that's, I think, largely, um, you know, the, the quick walkthrough of what I wanted to cover. Uh, and 
why can you know go quite a bit there are probably one or two more points i want to bring up that i think is uh important which is give me i'm sorry one second i just have to refer back to a note here um deep breath here for a second uh the there are I'm gonna, I'm trying to, it's a little bit detailed and nuanced but with amazon in particular there are some hidden problems and by that i mean they are not as good as one would hope at assigning products to vendors for example and there are situations we talked about alerts you know when do, when do i need to know something is going on where all of a sudden you're not going to be getting orders on products that you own because they're sending those orders to another vendor. It might not even be a publisher. I have publishers who are getting orders for video cards, for example. So one, as an example of a key opportunity is how do I detect when that happens so that I don't realize three months later, wow, I haven't gotten any orders for this book. It's been out of stock for a couple of weeks. Uh, and there are like, so for example, there's a, um, in Vendor Central or Advantage, there's a concept of a manufacturing view versus a source to consignment view. And what you'll see is if you see a product in one and not the other, that means most likely they're getting, they're trying to get that product from other places. So these are the, the hidden opportunities to improve sales by fixing these problems more quickly. And uh, anybody who's seen that happen, you know, again, we could get into it more in Q&A or afterwards. There are ways to see it faster and fix it faster and save yourself from uh, the sort of the call from the author or the agent, what happened to my my book? Because again, when you're managing hundreds or thousands of books, those, those can happen. So I think that's my prompting. And I think we can move on to the next phase now. Thanks. Um, I know we have uh, several questions that Ken has been posing and a couple of other folks have jumped in along the way. And we would encourage everybody to either add a question uh, or potentially just unmute yourself and, and jump into the conversation. I'm going to leave this slide up for just a minute, Ken, so that uh, folks who might want to reach out to Ted or Dan can write down the email addresses. And we will provide this presentation with, in follow-up uh, after the, the webinar. Great. Thank you. Um, really interesting presentation. Hey, um, I've been hearing about web services integration versus EDI integration. Is that something in order management or is that other, other kinds of uh, transactions between, say, publishers and, and retailers? No, it's, uh, I mean, it is It is the future. Uh, EDI, for those who don't know, is goes way, way back to the last millennium and, and not late in the last millennium. It is a very stable um, and, and, uh, and manageable technology, but it's certainly nothing that the kids today want to learn about. Um, where is being able to use SOAP to, uh, in our PubEasy service, for example, we have raise order calls instead of EDI purchase orders. We have order status checks instead of looking into shipping notifications. And I think it would be beneficial for the industry as a whole to explore ways to move away from the traditional exchange of EDI documents with the information locked in them into uh, more of a web services model. Um, can, on the fact that the EDI FTP uh, exchanges may take place once a day, for example, but you, if you have immediate, you know, calling and checking on things, the information is much more current using web services. So when, when people are thinking about those web services integrations, do they think about the structure being similar to the EDI documents? Um, I may be speaking a little through my hat here, but as I understand it, BIC real -time, the BIC real-time spec is basically uh, you know, a, a, a web services specification that covers all of the primary communications that are currently done using EDI. And uh, you know, moving to something like big real time, which is like getting people to move to a new version of Onyx or whatever, is a is a big effort. But it's definitely something that I think we would all profit from from doing. Uh, does Does anybody uh, now jumping from the sublime to the ridiculous? Does anybody use like mail in orders and fax in orders anymore? Or is that pretty well gone? <laughs> uh, well, uh, not to get too off topic, but uh, when we migrated. Uh, pub easy, uh, PubNet, you know, PubEasy to uh, that's a PubNet to uh, the, our new platform. We got rid of dial-up, 
uh, modems, uh, so not quite faxing. And actually, when we acquired the teleordering businesses from Nielsen in the UK and, and replaced that platform last year, they finally got rid of the mail orders that it used to be a retailer could go in and put in a purchase order and to teleordering and it would be put into an envelope and mailed to whoever the supplier was. So that that is the, the at least in my part of the world, that is finally officially over. And Ted, um, Jen, Jen in the chat is saying that they still receive orders for your phone, faxes, and email. I'm sure so, they do. Uh, so, uh, even if Ted's been able to excise some of that. Well, email uh, is pretty common, actually, especially when, yeah. when booksellers send their orders into their sales reps. Um, but yeah, fax, ouch, that's got to hurt. Whoever has to rekey that. And I think I think one of the things that suggests that Ted and I have, Ted's really had the conversation and I was listening is that we need a mechanism for transition. I don't think this is the right solution for us long-term, but we have to recognize that the industry is in multiple places right now. And so we need to have the ability to support multiple things as we transition to a more web two-way communication infrastructure. Yeah. But of course, the other half of that is goes into Dan's area, which is, so you do have better communication, more complete, more comprehensive information out there. What are the tools that can actually suck it all up and normalize it and put it into a form that can be analyzed and tracked and, and, and act, made actionable? AI will save us, of course, right? Huh. Um, so I've thought of e-commerce as something that you see when you're a consumer, you're going to buy something. And I hadn't really thought of it as uh, like a business to business kind of channel. Well, is electronic that... ordering is the old old school term. Okay. And okay, so electronic ordering is the business to business version of e-commerce? Exactly right. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the Fabulous Four or the Core Four? Core yeah, Four, core yes, four. but they are the Fabulous Four, yes. Um, I didn't see electronic payment in there. Is that because that's viewed as a financial transaction, not an order management transaction? Uh, there are reasons why some people don't want to get into that business because there's a lot of risk involved with managing transactions and a lot of compliance issues, you know, with handling credit cards and so forth. Um, there is obviously Batch, which has a very successful business in the UK where they've taken this on, if this is what you're, you're talking about. Uh, but there's no one who's, other than Batch, who's been trying to step into that role in the US. Okay. Hey, yeah, Justin has a question about, um, you mentioned the web service API. What was that again? Oh, so it was, it was We have different, we have. Or? We have price and availability, uh, personal pricing checks, order status checks, price and availability checks, and raise order calls that are all done through SOAP. Yeah, I think SOAP okay. was the it was the uh, thing that we're looking for. Or was it uh, BIC Real Time, which was the the list of the Bill, BIC Real Time, as I understand it, is I think an XML based um, uh, scheme yeah. that. Uh, that can handle soap calls. But here I'm. Yeah, it's part of, I mean, Bic Real Time is an early version of Editex, uh, which has continued to be developed over since uh, Real Time yes. was implemented about a decade ago. Um, but it's and, not widely uh, implemented, though, as I understand it. Uh, that's correct. I mean, yeah. we would certainly want to see a more widespread implementation in the US market than has been the case. Um, they're taking steps now to try and solidify that. There was a big project last year on order management to pick sponsor, but still, it's uh, it's it, even though it's been around for a decade, Ted, your your observation that Onyx three is 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 a metaphor. You know, that it's fifteen years old and just now getting fully implemented in the U.S. Um, Andrew notes that uh, SOAP has been replaced by REST in most modern apps. In a Yes. Uh, we're into the guts of the technology here, I guess. We do have communications via REST APIs, um, but I'm not going to say any more than that without having my my tech guy on the call. <laughs> I, I invited you to come, by the way. But <laughs> I think uh, um, this one might be one for Dan. Uh, Nancy asks, um, if, if 
if you could talk more about how to see when Amazon is looking for product when it's out of stock at the normal source. Uh, so yes, um, so they will, Amazon will order from other, like Ingram, for example, if they feel they can't get it from the publisher. Sometimes they'll do it when they can get it from the publisher, which is always kind of unusual and interesting. Uh, and so again, there are there are ways in the in the reporting to see. Um, so it's we call this like a, a direct a percentage of direct order. Uh, and so what'll happen is if you compare the the manufacturer and source views, you'll see they ordered ninety five percent of what they ordered in manufacturer came from sourced. I may have those backwards because I always do. Uh, and I'll tell you that ninety five percent of the of the supply that they got came from us as opposed to from other sources. And you generally would like to see that number as close to 100% as possible. But there, again, if you're running low on stock and they can get it somewhere else, that's fine, they'll do that. But there are times when they'll do that otherwise. Um, and that's not even counting, again, where they are going to the wrong places entirely for those products. So I don't know if that answered the question, but I'm happy to expand if it if it's helpful. One, one other thing is, uh, is, could you go into more detail about when it might make sense to reserve product for indies. So it's the whole margin versus velocity questions. Yeah, I can't generalize because I think every publisher, every publisher and every title may have different uh, factors involved, but that is essentially uh, the most important thing is to again, recognize, okay, I, you know, we have to partial fill or kill some orders because we can't fill everybody to what they want. And then the decision could be, as Ted suggested, to recognize when someone may be ordering more than they, they need. So if I know what, let's say, Amazon's sales velocity has been and I and accounting for things like seasonality and other uh, elements, I can predict what they're going to sell over the next two or three weeks, or let's say until I get more supply, I might choose to partial fill them in order to spread it around among the indies. Uh, but it really comes down to a decision is, uh, you know, what's more problematic is running out of stock at Amazon is a problem. And do I have to actually <coughs> sacrifice other partners in order to make sure that doesn't happen? You know, from my perspective, having the data to recognize that and the likelihood that'll happen and when that'll happen is what we we see as important. The, the, the rest of the decision come, is much more strategic and really comes down to uh, that. But, but I will say that losing sales velocity at Amazon has downstream effects. So even when you get the supply back in, you've lost sales rank, you've lost page views. It takes time to catch up. So there's a, there's a tail effect to that that doesn't go away the moment the inventory is back in stock. And that should be part of your uh, math on this is it, it may be we just don't want them to run out of stock. So let's make sure we give them enough. And then whatever we have left over, we'll, we'll spread around the room. So is there a way to, to, to manage it? So presumably they're ordering what they think they need, but presumably also a publisher might want to watch what they're ordering to make sure that they never actually fall out of stock, but you're still maintaining maintaining enough to give to other people. Right. I mean, there, there are also opportunities with SDQs and, the, and some publishers have the born to run program to, to push orders into them in case you think they're running low. But yeah, there are, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not mathematically challenging. It's just, it's organizing the data just to see, okay, you know, here's, here's what I think they're going to need for the next three weeks. I know they're going to order more next week anyway. So I may say, all right, they, I think they're ordering four or five weeks of inventory I want to spread that around. I'm going to under, underfill them in this case. Um, again, it's it's a very sort of strategic decision. But yeah, I believe that from it, in general, out, uh, running out of stock at Amazon is not a desirable uh, situation because, as I said, of, of those downstream effects there. Um, was there more to that, Ken? I apologize if I am missing. Well, no, I think it's I think it's an interesting, a uh, real interesting topic. Do they charge back? If uh, you short ship them, I I don't believe so. I, I wouldn't know in every case. The the, the bigger danger is shipping late, uh, more too commonly. Then then you do you know, are penalties yeah. for that, and that gets to my point of you know being able to say all right, we're going to kill these orders because they're almost certainly going to come back again next week. But then it's a question of well, which ones can I kill and not run out of stock on? So as I said, it's it's almost like a juggling uh, challenge where I have to balance 
my inventory, Amazon's inventory, their ordering behavior, my ability to influence that ordering behavior via SDQ or, or et cetera, to try to, I mean, they want to be just in time. It's just, and, and with backlist, they're pretty good at forecasting that, uh, at least for the next few weeks. They're not as good when you go out further, uh, but the publisher always knows more or certainly should. It makes me really glad that I'm not responsible for order management and inventory management. And I'm wondering if there's anyone on the call who might have a perspective, you know, who's actually well, sitting in the hot seat. Yeah, no? I do it. Every that was day. the opportunity for everybody to contribute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here at Sourcebooks, we look at uh, Amazon orders, the day that they come in, uh, and we compare it to what we have on hand and everything that Dan was talking about in regards to what are they likely to need in the near future. We then pare back the orders based on the amount of maximum inventory we can give them. Um, our fulfillment team updates all of the orders in both Vendor Central and, and our um, uh, SAP is what we use. So this is definitely something that we do regularly. That was, that was source books? Sure was. Okay, and given how successful Sourcebooks has been, I would say that's probably a pretty good strategy. <laughs> Ian, um, how, how much time does it take you? Like, I assume it's probably Tuesday, maybe Monday, where you get the biggest order file. Uh, how much time is spent just going through that? I'm, I'm assuming you guys have automation helping you. Uh, we do have some automation helping us, uh, but it takes three people. It takes our, our inventory manager, our Amazon sales lead, and then our, our, our representative of our fulfillment team. Um, and I think it e takes each person about 30 minutes. So a total of 90 minutes, thereabouts. Um, kind of depending on the size of the orders, the updating in Vendor Central and SAP is usually the part that takes the longest. And so, right. So obviously, uh, one of my clients, their struggle was their updating vendor central was one book at a time. So, and they have a lot of books. So they pretty much just said, we're just going to deal with the top 50 or so because we don't have time yeah. to do them and then get the orders processed. So one of the, the real benefits was when we were able to automate that process and they could do the whole file and get the whole, uh, get everything pushed out. And that gets, again, to communicating data back and forth with the partners in, in ways that will work. It's a good example of, of a problem with a solution, but boy, it's not an easy or efficient process, say for a university press or any number of, of suppliers to manage. Right. So if you find, if you're, if you're spending hours daily or even weekly, and there is probably an opportunity to streamline that and do it more efficiently and also eliminate errors. Yeah. Um, just just running the calculations uh, using a, mo a mathematical model as opposed to eyeballing each one individually will be a huge benefit. So Nancy, you had your hand up and you're on mute. I did. Um, this is this is a very helpful conversation. Um, I'm the director of production and I work very closely with my uh, product manager and uh, in pulling um, micro inventories and, uh, you know, making sure that Amazon gets their stock. So uh, I had posed the question about how to see if Amazon is, um, you know, where they're getting their stock, if they're not getting oh, it yep. when, when we have to uh, decline an order or we're out of stock or whatever. Um, and I do get reports from Ingram as far as what our daily or our weekly, excuse me, our monthly sales are in year to date, that sort of thing. So I've been comparing them. Um, and of course that's a very tedious process uh, getting what the out of stock is on a weekly basis and then comparing it to what the monthly sales are. So um, I had asked the question about how to see that in the Amazon reports. And so that's, um, you said 95% of, Roughly, as an example, ninety-five percent of supply from publisher, and of course, we do want that to be a hundred percent. So right. it doesn't have to roll over to. Are you an advantage or a vendor central? We are currently in vendor central. So you just as an exercise, if you pull your uh, 
source and manufactured news for sales for a week or for year to date, you'll see the difference in those numbers. And okay. that will, that that ratio will tell you what what percentage was direct source. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So one one of them represents what they bought, and one of them represents what they bought from you. Okay. Right. Okay. And so if you see a if you see some numbers that are lower, and then then of course you want to, again you want to correlate that and then with what their uh, what their in stock you know their on hand is and what your ability to fulfill is, you will find almost certainly examples where. There's no reason for them to buy anywhere else, but they still do. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so Dan, thinking about the inventory uh, implications here, there used to be an issue of trying to estimate demand off of orders versus shipments. Mm -hmm. um, is there, do most of the big uh, retailers now place an order, if they can't be fulfilled, they cancel and then order again. So do you get a- Yeah, I, mean, I certainly can speak to Amazon since recently my focus has been much more on them. I, and I hate to make them the constant topic, but I think that's, is the, yeah, they, they will reorder every week. If you don't fill it, they'll just reorder it again and again and again. Um, and, you know, it, not always. And sometimes that number will change or they may stop. But I, I don't, I can't tell you when and why they would shift to order from somewhere else. Uh, there's obviously factors, you know, that they can see, which I'm, and I'm sure a lot of it is financial. If they can get it, if they think they can get it either cheaper or they can get it close enough in price and you're not able to send it, they'll get it somewhere else. Why they do it when you have stock again, is a different question. And again, there's probably different math involved. Uh, so maybe looking at both of those numbers is the way to come up with what the true demand through Amazon was. Maybe netting out returns well, at some point. I mean, in terms of demand and forecasting, yeah, I look at consumer orders as the real indicator of demand because what retailers are buying from you is their best guess, but really doesn't indicate what's you know it's the sell through that generates the, the what I call what I call real true demand, and understanding that you know over time. You want to look back for 12, maybe 26 weeks. You want to look seasonally to see if I'm coming up on a season. And, and you build a model that basically says, okay, I think uh, based on what's on hand, what's on order, and the sales velocity, they have a three and a half week supply of this title. So that, and, and if I believe they're going to reorder next week, that tells me I, I could fill it now or I could fill it next week. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, you, you may see books where they have, far more supply than or you know weeks on hand than yeah. uh you want them to have and that's where you would say all right let's let's trim back the ordering here it gets trickier with again with the bigger uh retailers because there's multiple locations uh, and sometimes i mean this is just a minor thing but it's not minor is it uh, they'll balance inventory through your warehouse. Like, and so instead of shipping from one warehouse to another, they'll ship it, they'll return it to you and order it somewhere else. So it's hard to, you don't really know what they've got at each location, but it's another element to be aware of in your thinking and to say, so it's not generally not good to say, oh, they ordered a hundred here and a hundred there. I'll just fill that hundred and not, and zero out the other order. That's not going to end well. That's going to probably generate returns. Interesting. I would just um, like to make a comment, if you don't mind, that um, point of sale and, and sale through is essential information, incredibly valuable, but it is something of a lagging indicator. And, uh, you know, it's it doesn't tell you how many to print when you're going, you know, no. from the start, it, but it does tell you about replenishment, obviously. And I think there's probably work to be done on measuring indicators, leading indicators pre-orders, wish lists yeah. on, you know, whatever. For NYPs, pre-orders are one of the best indicators of demand, glance views, conversion rate, right? So I mentioned, you know, there's different data sources. So the traffic file that tells you your glance views and conversion are important. Uh, and, you know, for a lot of reasons, but it certainly helps you understand demand. And I'm, I'm sure there's information in tools like Edelweiss, you know, wish lists or, you know, titles that haven't actually been ordered yet um, that uh, could also fill out that, that, that information. If there was a way to tap it and share it, of course. You know, we we mentioned uh, returns a few times in here. Uh, um, I recall back in the day, maybe it's still there, that deductions um, in anticipation of credits w was a big issue. Is that still an issue? 
I couldn't tell you. I, I, I saw I, Nancy. I, I saw, maybe somebody else I saw, does. I saw Nancy Wentz, so I'm wondering if that's a sign. Um, yeah, we've we've had that uh, issue. Um, I'm not the person that deals quite as closely with the uh, financial end, so I probably can't speak to that. But yeah. So, were there other questions? Uh, like I kind of ran ran through all my favorite ones and all the ones that, that occurred to me. Um, I'm sure there are other uh, other topics here. Um, anybody else have uh, something they're interested in uh, learning more about? Ken, Ian had just uh, added something at the end of the chat, uh, I think while the conversation was going on um, a moment ago about that if uh, Amazon at least has guidelines that if you reject an order uh, uh, repeatedly, um, they may attempt to source elsewhere and that can contribute. I don't know if Dan, if, if that's been an experience that you have uh, any insight on. I mean, my, it hasn't come up with my clients because I, you know, presumably, everybody should know those guidelines and their own terms and manage to those as well. You know, what we really do is provide tools to help uh, more easily see that. So for example, if, if, I, if someone had said, I need to know when I've rejected this order twice in a row, so I don't do it the third time, we could provide that uh, indicator to say, okay, here's a, a flag to say, don't reject it or understand that if you do, uh, you're going into the penalty box, if you will. Um, you know, but and again, that that those sort of things make it so much easier to avoid those mistakes, right? To, to put those those processes in place, to, and and you know that. A and thank you because that's a great point, and one of many things that you have to keep track of, which is why this process is so horribly complex. You know, maybe and if we have. No, go ahead. Ted. I was going to say, if we have a few minutes, if people wanted to just put into the chat just for posterity and maybe for discussion, if they could change one thing today, what would it be? You know, that would be interesting to know, even if you're too shy to say it in, in front of the group. But continue, Brian. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to add that you know, I started out in introducing Ted and Dan by talking about the work we're doing to transform supply chain communication. We have uh, an event planned in the greater New York area for January 24th, a one day event where we're gonna kind of walk through what the business case is for those changes. And then ideally the priorities and the sequencing for that over a two or three year period, more likely three, it's a big change. Um, one of the things that, that's very much in my mind based on this conversation is visibility into the pipeline, You know, to know where inventory is and where it's moving. I mean, I think Dan and Ted have both made that argument but particularly Dan, um, you know, that, that sometimes things are happening that you don't completely understand and you're looking at it at the level of an order or a particular um, retail partner. And it's it's hard to know, is this is this a sign that they're out of stock or a sign that they're making adjustments that affect our, 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 uh, our decisions to reprint, et cetera. So, I mean, a lot of this conversation came out of the work and that you helped lead with Gary Lyons uh, from River Rock and um, Kathy Belgar in particular to talk about um, ways to better forecast. And ultimately, forecasting then puts you into order management, inventory management, uh, and demand planning. So it's a lot of a lot of moving parts, but I think we can do a better job as an industry. Yeah. I, no one had asked, but I, I do think that, again, the print-on-demand option is going to become more interesting as the time goes on hopefully it'll become a little bit less expensive and start and it starts to really create the you know it's again now we're getting into manufacturing discussion but it, but pod really ties into order management which is how do i want to fill from inventory do i want to still fill pod um and and the one thing i would say is everybody has to have a financial model to understand what the impact of a pod fill is to help them decide when it's useful. I was going to say music to Ted Hill's ear, ears <laughs> that Ted, that Jen wants to see uh, retailers more, more effectively to PubNet. I think for us, uh, we, we embrace PubNet and uh, MVB is an important member of BISG, but I, I think it's absolutely the case. We want to move people away from offline to online ordering. And actually, we are working on a solution in that area to enable uh, web access to pub to PubNet too. So, but that's not for for this year. Right. Very nice. All you right. Know, well, we're not getting it done in the next twenty days. 
No. <laughs> yeah, poor Ted. Um, Get it all done this year. Yeah. We're uh, reaching the end of our uh, end of our time here. Um, any last questions before we wrap up? Well, actually, Jim yeah. uh, from Anthology has just put in something in the chat, which is absolutely right, that many of the retailers are not fully u utilizing the tools they have in front of them. Right. And that there could be certainly a lot of training and awareness uh, on that area that could improve that too. So. I remember back years ago um, when I had something to do with order management, um, thinking about offering a discount for use of online tools to encourage people to move to online versus manual. Not that I would talk about discount or pricing or anything of the sort in this forum, but something we looked at years ago. Yeah, Brian, I hope that was okay. It's fine. Thank you for uh, for moderating and Ted and Dan, thank you uh, both for the prep that you did to, to get everybody kind of better informed about this, as well as answering the questions that are on people's minds. Really, a really great job. Thank you, guys. Yeah, hey, I'm, thank you. I'm happy to address any follow-up questions anybody has. Got my email address. Please reach out. Yep, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks. Thanks thank so you. much.